Let's see. I have been, uh, so we will call the Campo meeting to order. I have 2.02 p.m. on Monday, March the 8th. And uh, I believe I've been trying to follow as people have uh, come on. So please tell me if I, I can't hear anybody. These are the individual. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, the, the, do I, is Ann Howard on yet? Okay. What about Clara Beckett? Judge Brown. Mayor Hewson. Commissioner. Oh, I see Commissioner Jones. Um, uh, Mayor Schroeder. Okay, and then um, I know Mayor Van Arsdale is going to be a little bit late. So, um, Kimberly, if you can watch for those folks to pop in and mark them when they show up. But um, we do have a quorum, and so we will go ahead and start our meeting. There's no one that signed up specifically for um, public comments. Uh, there's one individual that that indicated they wanted to speak on some agenda items, but was late, um, and that's Miss Joseph. So what I will do. Um, even though uh, her sign up was received after the 1 p.m. deadline, um, I will go ahead and give her three minutes on the item of her choice. Um, and she can actually cover all three of those if she wants to, but um, we'll go ahead, even though it was late, we'll um, allow her to speak. Um, there is nothing for item number three, executive session. Um, agenda item number four is report from the technical advisory committee meeting and Mr. Hodge is unable to join us today. So we will have a report from Chad on that one. Chad, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Long and board members. Um, so attack meeting was held remotely last Monday, March 1st. And this was actually the February meeting, um, but it had been delayed by a week from its originally scheduled date due to the winter storm. and. The recovery efforts, um, but we did have a quorum and just 1 action item beyond approval of the minutes. Um, so there was a presentation and recommendation on performance measure targets as an action item. Um, following the presentation was some discussion about the Campo region compared to other parts of Texas. Um, and we also discussed tracking of performance measures over time and noted that Campo is developing a dashboard uh, to track progress on performance measures. Uh, following the discussion, the recommendation for the policy board to approve the performance measures passed unanimously. Campo staff also provided TAC members an update on the prioritization process for the Category 7 deferred projects, the spring amendment cycle, and TxDOT's transportation alternative set-aside funding call. Finally, Campo also requested information from committee members on their feasibility or other planning studies that need to be included in the fiscal year 2022 and 2023 Unified Planning Work Program or UPWP. Um, and that covers everything that we had at the TAC meeting. Great, thank you, Chad. I appreciate that. Does anybody have any questions of Chad um, on his report? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to um, agenda item number Five. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes from our February 8th meeting? So moved. Okay, I hear council member um, Matea, was there a second? I'll second. second. Oakley. Oakley second. I think I heard another voice, but I guess I, he, he spoke loudest. So um, we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Um, is there anybody against this motion? Uh, Commissioner uh, Chair Long, I had understood that there was a discrepancy, and I thought, is Mayor Houston on? I thought she had uh, some information to correct the record. I don't see her on the, she's not a, a attendance at this point. Is it possible to come back and, um, and. Do you know what the minutes? concern was? 
You know, I'm not remembering it. Um, yeah, I'm not remembering the details, um, but I, I think she had wanted to bring it up. Well, she did not indicate that to me, did she? And she didn't tell you what it was about? Uh, she didn't, I've just forgotten. Oh, oh okay. I, um, Chair, I can speak to that. Oh, thank okay. you. I think she, um, I think she had noticed because she mentioned it to me also that that she thought that we had uh, actually voted uh, on a motion to postpone on the bylaw item, and she didn't see that referenced in the minutes. I have not reviewed the minutes myself, but I think that's my memory, Commissioner Shea, of what she had mentioned. Yeah, that that sounds about right. I'm sorry, I wasn't, I didn't jot it down. I didn't, and I wasn't remembering the particulars. I'm just checking with her to see if she's on the call. So I thought she wanted to bring it up. Her name doesn't show up. Um, well, Chair, we, we could go ahead and could, couldn't she bring it up later if she needs to? Yeah. Tim. Also, also Commissioner Trevino is saying, is saying that he can't uh, hear any sound. At, uh, everybody else can. I wonder if it's something on his end. Yeah, uh, he's just texting. And that's what his staff is saying as well. Everybody yeah. else is having a prop is, is hearing fine. Yeah, and Commissioner Beckett has joined us as well. Um, so I will mark her down. Um, uh, so does anybody else have any comment on the minutes or any recollection of what council member kitchen has raised? I mean, I, I recall the discussion, but um, I did not review the minutes thoroughly, so I couldn't, I couldn't tell you about it, but is this an issue we can just take up when Mayor Houston joins? Um, yeah, we will sure. skip the minutes for now, move on to item number six, um, take, discuss and take appropriate action on the Campo executive director to begin negotiation on the TDM contract. Um, and I believe there is a report from Nirov on this one. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Long. Good afternoon. My name is Nira Ved, Campo staff. And uh, for this item, I will begin with a brief explanation of transportation demand management or TDM. Essentially, it is a collection of strategies to reduce demand on the transportation network by redirecting travel towards other modes, times, or routes. For example, if you decide to leave for work later to avoid traffic, that is TDM. If you decide to take the bus, that's TDM. And if you decide to take another route to avoid traffic, that is also TDM. The TDM program that the consultant will manage is an implementation of the TDM plan adopted in late 2019 and will also incorporate lessons learned from the ongoing pandemic. Campo's approach to TDM will be geared towards essential and other workers who do not work a traditional nine to five job or where work from home is not an option. Additionally, we will gather data to have a better comparison of the effectiveness of TDM programs to traditional road projects. To help ensure the program's effectiveness, a steering committee will be formed to help meet the program's goals. The steering committee serves as a forum to exchange ideas and ensure the impact is felt regionally. I also want to note that the Community Solutions website is and will be a key feature in the regional TDM program. There will be no loss of function or access for current users as we move forward. In fact, Right Amigos, which is a subconsultant for the top ranked firm, is also the current vendor for Commute Solutions, which will ensure a seamless transition. Next slide, please. If board members recall, last month staff showed this slide that details our evaluation process for procuring consultant services. Next slide. And the regional TDM program received four responses to this RFP and two were chosen to participate in interviews. Total scores show the top ranked firm as Urban Trans, which includes their subconsultants, Adisa Communications, ICF, and Right Amigos. Next slide. For this last slide, staff requests the Transportation Policy Board to authorize the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with the top ranked firm to manage the regional TDM program. Thank you. Um, thanks, Nirav. Um, if you could change the view back to the whole panel now, please. Thank you. Um, so, if y'all recall, I, it was either in our 
September or October meeting, I think Commissioner Shea, you had asked that the RFP be sent out to everyone on the policy board, which took place. And then November 5th, I believe is when the um, RFP was sent out. And um, then Nero just provided you the report on the scoring and on um, and uh, on the process. So is there a motion to approve item number six? Madam Chair, may I ask a quick question to Nero? Sure. Nero, thank you for the presentation. Quick and expeditious. You know we love that in this kind of meetings. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned the subcommittee. Is the subcommittee, is that going to be um, com the composite of the, being the TAC members or is it um, policy board members or what do you have in regards to thinking about that? So they will mostly be drawn from uh, TAC members, uh, though if uh, there are other members who um, will have uh, TDM, I guess, uh, expertise. They will also be considered, but mostly it's usually, uh, especially for, so it usually comes from TAC. Cool. This is the short answer. Thank you, bud. I appreciate it. So, and I think um, it's referred to throughout as the steering committee. And I think that might have been what threw some people off, but um, so are there any other questions? I had just a couple of quick clarifications. Yes, um, ma'am. So the the reference to the 2019 TDM plan that um, that the Campbell Policy Board adopted that's is that that is that incorporated in and that's part of what the, um, the consultant will be sort of building their work on. You made a reference to it. I just wanted to understand how it would work. Yes, ma'am. The uh, the program will implement the plan. Okay. Um, and one of the things that um, I've been talking with TechSot about, and I think we've all noticed it, is how dramatically the um, uh, initial um, um, action to shut down workplaces because of COVID, uh, how dramatically that transformed our traffic problems. There's no more congestion. Um, and what I'm uh, wondering about with this TDM plan is how how will it work with local communities to support telework um, implementation. That wasn't clear to me from the document either. Uh, sure, so for uh, telework, that's kind of uh, gonna be dependent. That's where the outreach comes in because yeah, there was a lot of, I mean, yes, there was <laughs> many industries that were able to transition to work from home quickly and effectively, but there were also, uh, we imagine uh, industries that could not do it or were not quite able to do it. So part of that, where I mentioned the third bullet in the first slide was the data gathering aspects is we need to go out and find out which industries or uh, professions weren't able to exactly um, benefit or use work from home and see if we can uh, get them to see if we can help them achieve that goal. Because um, I think that this would be a valuable part of our, our long range transportation planning is to just have an understanding of the value of telework in um, essentially extending the life of our of our um, our transportation infrastructure. It, it, ease, it helps to ease con congestion. Um, so I'm, I'm just wanting to understand how that will be encouraged and supported um, as part of the TDM plan. Commissioner Shea, this is Ashley. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we we are looking to do with this contract is we're we've already started the process of exploring the data is available for, for us to purchase, um, where we could start to get a sense of um, not only origin and destination of trip, we can also see um, traffic in a, in a in a more real time uh, basis. It does exist uh, today, uh, unlike um, in the past. And so um, we want to try to target uh, those places and in some cases those employers and local government once we get this data and we do the, the outreach to see can we um, uh, encourage and enhance um, the use of telework a little bit more where it makes sense for those folks. Uh, and then I don't know if this, uh, if this would be included in the um, <clears throat> TDM effort or our larger sort of safety initiatives, but it's uh, it's it's striking to me that um, there was a, a post from uh, NACTO that uh, traffic is down 13%, but traffic deaths are up 
eight percent. So I don't um, know how we deal with that, but that is a obvious problem. So we do have a um, a safety um, a safety program and a safety um, analysis report that we do that near of also run. Um, so we've been looking at that as well, um, as well as that is part of the performance measures that um, we adopt for TechStock. You're going to hear about that. I think it's the next item. Um, so we've been looking at that. And, and by the way, um, my counterparts across the country are telling me they're seeing the same things. Um, where what happened is we saw a, a big reduction in uh, traffic, but we saw a big increase in uh, crashes and fatalities because a lot of people use that lack of congestion on the roadways as a chance to really drive very fast. Um, so from what I understand from uh, um, things I'm seeing um, um, written report are that um, the crashes involving people driving greater than 100 uh, miles an hour went up um, significantly. And um, when those crashes happen at those speeds, it's, it's never, um, it's rarely a very good outcome. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so, is there a motion for item number six? I'll move passage of item six, and then after I have a second, I have some direction to add. Please. Second. Um, uh, Councilmember Ellis, I think I saw your hand go up for a second. So, motion made by Councilmember Alter, second by Councilmember Ellis. All right. Any discussion? Councilmember Alter. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate the presentation from Nirav and um, uh, we had shared some direction that we wanted to add um, with Ashby before and some of that got captured into the presentation, uh, but because the questions still um, linger just based on the paperwork alone, I wanted to um, suggest some direction. I think it is all very much in line with what you're presenting for Two of the items that are in the direction, and then the third, but was not necessarily addressed in the presentation. Um, so, what I'd like to propose is that TPB directs the Campo Executive Director to include in the TDM contract as clarification for Task 4.0 Regional Coordination that the consultant will work with the Campo TAC to convene a TDM subcommittee as recommended by the adopted Campo Regional TDM Plan to advise Campo staff and the consultant on the development and implementation of a regional TDM program that aligns with the regional TDM plan, the evaluation and selection of an online TDM platform to operate and maintain. Um, so that is um, the first direction and that is essentially to follow the, the, the suggestion in the TDM plan that we all passed that we would have a tax subcommittee um, that does not preclude adding other people to that subcommittee if that is what is necessary for this steering committee. So I think that was discussed. I presume that that should be fine. Um, the second direction was be um, with respect to the public engagement plan. So the TPB directs the Campo Executive Director to brief the TPB on the public engagement plan prior to accepting for task 2.0 as complete from the consultant. The consultant shall consult with the Campo TAC TDM subcommittee in developing the PEP. Um, so that has to do with a comprehensive um, engagement plan. And just because so many of us who are on the board um, have connections and can, can support that um, to help that um, really reach the populations that we are trying to target who haven't been served um, from some of the prior initiatives. Um, and then the third direction is the TPB directs the Campo Executive Director to brief the TPB on the TDM online platform to be operated by the consultant under task 2.1 prior to selection if the recommendation is to change the platform from the current Ride Amigos platform. So the first and the third, I think, were addressed in the presentation, but just for clarity, would like that direction to be in the record. Um, and then the second one is just um, adding the step that the Campo Executive Director brief the TPB on the public engagement plan before it is accepted as deliverable. So, um, I, I just want to clarify, 
I think in the presentation, it, it's just, it's semantics. I think you're calling it a subcommittee. The NIRV was calling it a steering committee, but I think it's still the same concept. So um, I think that to your point was addressed and um, Ashby, um, I think you're being asked to um, just bring a report back to the policy board on the public engagement plan. Um, I don't see that any of those are um, difficult to do. My ask, and I plead again, please, I got this email at 131 today. When you all have suggestions like this, it, it, it would be most beneficial to be able to, to get that to staff sooner so that the whole policy board can have a chance to, and like I said, I, I think most of these were addressed, but but please out of deference to and respect for our colleagues, please try to get these things um, out a little bit sooner. That would be so helpful. Um, Ashby, do any of those things that seem like they're not covered um, in what you planned on doing anyway? Uh, no, ma'am. So. Uh, those things that were laid out by uh, council member Alter are are things that we ru routinely do uh, with these. Okay, um, council member kitchen. I see you have a question. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying chair. You know, um, I had mentioned this before, and I'm happy to work with Ashby and others if they'd like to proceed this way. 1 of the things that would be great is if we had um, a message board. Uh, that's one of the things that's allowed for um, governmental bodies. Um, let's for the city, for example, we have a message board that we can post things through, and that helps. But also, I did give uh, Ashby and I talked about this on Friday, and as you recall, I raised, I, I let you know, Chair Long, on Friday that we had some ideas about the TDM. I agree. Right, but and I'm just asking if you have it in writing, try to you can get it to Ashby, and he can send that out to the rest of the. The policy board um, in advance. Absolutely, absolutely. We will try to do that in the future. We thank you. Process on Friday. So, um, are I there just any comment? Yes, I'm not done. There. Okay, sorry. I thought you were finished. No, that's fine. I just wanted to say this is great, and um, uh, I appreciate uh, the um, the intent to as it was described. I think this is a good moving forward. And I just wanted to second the the concept of briefing us on the public engagement plan. Um, I, and there may be other ways to Ashby that you'd like to engage the policy board. I think we can be helpful um, to you and to the consultants. Um, I know the intent is to really reach out to um, underserved populations. Um, and one of the deliverables also includes um, environmental justice meeting coordination and materials. So I'm excited about those aspects of of this, and I think that um, as a body, we can be helpful uh, to you and the consultant um, as you do that work. So I think the briefing, uh, coming back and briefing us would be helpful. And uh, I agree, uh, Vice Chair Kitchen, and um, um, we'll, we'll come back and do the briefing for certain, but we will also be reaching out to uh, some of you to help us convene um, some of the meetings, uh, if it gets to a point where we can um, have some of these meetings uh, in person, if if the vaccinations move forward uh, enough. Um, and just as a reminder, back when we were doing the um, regional active transportation plan, we reached out uh, through council member Alter uh, to uh, help us um, reach out to some folks for the meeting that we had over the school for the day. And she showed up for that and helped us with that. All right, is there any other discussion on this item? Madam Chair, I just want to give a lot of credit to this board, Commissioner Shea um, in particular as well. This, the TDM, we discussed this years ago and had this discussion and its fruition was, I mean, no one expected a pandemic to happen <laughs> and we've moved forward with it as well. So it says a lot about this board uh, looking at the forefront for, for thinking regarding this. And so pretty excited to see this happen. So good, good job, Ashby and staff. Thank you. All right, um, is there anyone, I'm, I'm sorry, is there anyone against the motion? Okay, we are gonna take that as everybody else is for the motion. So motion passes unanimously. And just as a clarification, I still have um, uh, the only, I have Mayor Schroeder and Mayor Van Arsdale as still um, not 
um, in attendance. Has, All right. has Mayor um, Houston shown up? I don't see Mayor Houston on here. She, uh, she's on there. Um, I got here. I had technical difficulties. So I got here about 206. So um, we'll go on to item number seven. And um, I don't, I can't tell, is Miss Joseph on the line? I don't see her unless she hasn't been admitted to the meeting. I don't see her. Hello, Chair. There she is. Okay, Miss Joseph, um, I'm going to give you three minutes, but um, it, it will be inclusive of agenda items number seven, eight, and nine. Your request to speak um, came in after the deadline, but in deference to you, we're going to go ahead and allow you to speak. But if you would condense your comments on those three agenda items um, to three minutes. Um, let's see, let me get my timer going and, um, all right, go ahead, Ms. Joseph. You have three minutes to cover items seven, eight, and nine. Ms. Thank Joseph? you, Madam Chair. Okay, go ahead. This is Zenobia Joseph and board members. I'm not sure what deadline you're referring to, Madam Chair. It said 1 o'clock p.m., and that's the time my email was sent. Um, but at any rate, if uh, that is not correct, I would just ask you to ask staff to update it because I actually complied with what was posted online for the public. As it relates specifically to the transit asset management, I just wanted to ask, I did follow the March 1st, 2021 presentation uh, by Mr. Ryan Collins, and I was not sure what he meant specifically by small projects. So at some point he talked about uh, funding for small projects that would come in the future. I'm not sure if he was referring to the transit asset management or if that was item eight, but if he could just speak to what the small projects entail. He talked about pedestrian uh, projects and bike ped. My comment is specifically related to uh, the need for transportation on FM 734 and the pedestrian access, which is lacking to Samsung. As you may be aware, and I've mentioned this before, there's no sidewalk from Dessau and Palmer to Samsung, and across from Palmer is the 425-acre development East Village. And so I would just ask you to recognize the need for pedestrian access there. And as it relates to small projects and projects in general, I did have a question as it relates to Metro Rapid, and I thank Mr. Ashby Johnson for the email. Uh, the scoring criteria that I'm referring to is in the Regional Transportation Plan 2045 but I'm not sure to what extent the staff has latitude to simply take a project from there uh, and to transfer it over to the new monies that you've received under the CARES Act funding. And so as it relates to your bylaws, which is item nine, I just want to ask you to consider integrity and specifically Capital Metro uh, passed their ethics policy on November 14, 2018. However, I just want you to be aware that the public, when Project Connect went before the voters on November the 3rd, 2020, they were not um, told about the difference in scoring criteria for the Metro Rapid Line. So there was a lack of transparency. I know that may sound confusing, but the bottom line is that the transportation, uh, the three Metro Rapid Lines that serve Northeast Austin, which would have included Parma Lane, were all cheaper, less expensive than the line that will serve Southwest Austin, which aligns with the South Park Parkway project, $633 million. It's a lot of information, but if you could just address how the, the projects will be funded um, and selected, I would appreciate it. If you have any questions, I'll gladly answer them at this time. And thank, thank you for allowing you, me to speak. Um, thank you, um, Ms. Joseph. Um, I think uh, some of the questions you raised 
have to do with transportation alternatives and not necessarily what we're talking about on these particular items. Um, but uh, if there's any follow up, um, I will ask uh, that if you could put those questions in writing to staff, they might be able to help you because I think it's it's on a different topic on the transportation alternatives topic. And lastly, Madam Chair, I'll just uh, tell you that I'm looking on page 30 of 101 of your board packet um, for transit safety targets. So that's where I was trying to make my comments in the context of. But thank okay, you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, we'll now take up item number seven. Madam Chair, uh, Madam Chair, can we just clarify what is the requirement for people to uh, indicate an interest in speaking? G generally, most meetings, people can show up and speak. She that, said the posting says by one o'clock on the day of. It was, it was the the posting does say that and um it was received after 1 p.m but again we i accommodated that and allowed her to speak so i think we should be all good um on item number seven um let's see i think ryan you have that particular item uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chair Long. Um, and I can try and address Zenobia's comments uh, later on. I think if, uh, if, uh, I'll try and get in touch with her and see if I can clarify um, the comments that she made. Um, so, um, uh, thanks. And so, uh, quickly, I know we've got a long meeting, so I wanted to, um, this item is regarding the transportation performance measures. Um, I presented a deep dive on the transportation uh, targets uh, last time, uh, but for the presentation today, I really wanted to kind of take a step back and take a holistic approach. Uh, to why we're setting these targets and really what they mean for the policy board in general. Um, we got some really good feedback at the technical advisory committee uh, last Monday. Um, and the two big questions that really came out of that for me were, you know, why are we setting these targets? What are the impacts? And then really, how are we doing as a region um, in regards to the targets that we're setting? So I did want to kind of take a step back and, and talk about that a little bit. Um, and one of the things that I, I mentioned uh, last time was that uh, back in 2012, uh, the uh, Congress adopted MAP 21 and again in, in the FAST Act as well, uh, they really mandated a, a transportation performance management system. Um, and this is really just a strategic approach that uses uh, uh, data and information to really guide our uh, transportation investment decisions, as well as policy uh, in the region uh, against these national goals that, uh, that Congress has set out. And it's, it's really important that targets are really just one piece of that. They're really just the measuring stick with which we can monitor our progress as a region over time. And, and this is an evolving system. Uh, this is something that's really kind of started for, in my mind. I feel like it started in earnest when we revamped our, uh, our project selection criteria back in 2017. Uh, we developed that selection criteria based on those major goals that Congress set out. And so uh, we really used a performance based approach when we made recommendations and funded projects out of that process. So that was a big push. And that's really 1 of the, the teeth of the targets, you know, with which we measure ourselves. Uh, we're, we make these strategic investments and also policy uh, decisions that really impact uh, how well we can, uh, you know, move those targets around. So, um, so along with the project selection criteria, we set the regional targets. Um, and then again, uh, this is an evolving situation over time, but we monitor the, these investments. Uh, we're tracking the projects that we invested in, um, and we're going to be monitoring the, the impact of those projects over time. So after these projects are built, uh, we're going to be measuring the impact they have on the region as a whole. So we can really kind of see exactly what the return of invest return on investment is for those projects. And then we also incorporate uh, a TPM approach into all of our planning products. Um, the transportation improvement program. If you look at a regional transportation plan, all the studies we do, and as Nir mentioned earlier, I think the, the TDM program itself is also one of those things that just takes a performance management approach. So anything that's really data centric um, is really part of that system. So uh, when we talk about the targets, I don't wanna talk about them in isolation. I feel like that's something that, that kind of gets lost is that these are really part of a larger system that Campo uh, initiates. So I just wanna kind of, Take that overall view. Um, Emily, if you'll go to the next slide, please. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Congress did set those performance goal areas. So we look at safety, infrastructure condition, congestion, reliability, and freight movement, um, environmental sustainability, and also reducing uh, project delays and uh, having quicker project development. Um, and so the performance measure process in, in regards to the targets, um, the goal areas were set by Congress, um, but then the goals and the performance measures themselves uh, go through the federal rulemaking process at the USDOT. Um, in our world, that is uh, FHWA and FTA, and they've been systematically going through the rulemaking process uh, for each performance measure. And that's why you'll see them all come on. They've all come online at different times. Um, but then once those performance measures are codified in law, uh, we, uh, the US DOT, excuse me, the state DOT, uh, regional transit agencies, as well as the MPO uh, set targets in regards to these performance measures. And then we incorporate those into our plans and then uh, the programming, programming and investment decisions that we make. If you go to the next slide, please. So this is a, a overarching summary of all the uh, performance targets that I presented last time. And um, I'm, I'm not gonna go into these individually, So, um, but at the end of this presentation, if you do have any specific questions about any of these performance targets, uh, please feel free to ask because I've got the, the data with me and be more than happy to go into detail on any of these. Um, but really, this is a summary. Anything that you see in light blue is a target that is numerically going down. Um, and then anything in dark blue is a, a target that is numerically going up. Um, and I would ask you to pay attention to the metric that's being used uh, when you're looking at the changes. Um, obviously, number of fatalities, that target is going down, and that's a good thing. Uh, but and also, if you look at pavement conditions, for example, uh, that's going up, and that's pavements in good condition. So that's a that's a good thing. So uh, when you're uh, looking at these, I would uh, pay attention to that. Um, and then new uh, uh, performance measures that we haven't had yet are transit safety targets. Um, now they're setting those and they're pretty much the same metrics that we use for the highway side, um, but those are brand new metrics that are based off of the uh, transit agency's uh, safety uh, plans that they make. Um, the one thing I do want to clarify is that PM1, 2, and 3 are all uh, FHWA and TxDOT targets. Um, and then on the transit side, we have transit asset management and transit safety targets. These are averages between the three transit agencies we have in the region. Uh, we have Capital Metro, the city of Round Rock, and the city of um, San Marcos. And so we've averaged their targets uh, in regards to those. So these are regional. Um, but then when you look at the on the highway side, we are adopting the, the state, recommending uh, adopting the statewide targets. If you go to the next slide, please. So this is a, just a, look, a different look at the same information uh, and really kind of the the important thing that I pulled away from the, the technical advisory committee is, uh, you know, how, how are we doing as a region in regards to these targets that we're adopting? And, you know, the things you see in light green, these are uh, targets with which we are exceeding. Um, and anything in dark green is something that we're currently below the target. And then if we're either equal with the target or it's a new target, it's in gray. But um, I think what this the story I'm trying to say here is that overall, uh, we are doing better in most metrics than uh, than the statewide average, which is really important. I do want to clarify that obviously on safety performance measures, any number is not a good number. Um, so when I say we're we're doing better, that does not mean we're necessarily doing good, but we are trending better than the the statewide average. So that's just an important clarification to make. Um, we do um, safety. As, as far as fatalities, if you adjust for population, we are right on trend with the, the target, um, but our rate of fatalities, number of injuries, and, and rate of serious injuries are, are lower than the statewide average if you adjust for population. Um, and then the region itself, we do have uh, uh, very good uh, interstate pavement conditions as well as national highway pavement conditions and below average uh, system pavement and poor conditions. And then our system performance, uh, our reliability currently is, is below the 70% target um, and our freight time reliability as well. So um, I do want to point out that there is one metric. So if you look at transit asset management, um, I believe Cap Metro did have a fleet that aged out last year, and that's why they uh, did not meet that target. But I would expect that will change next year. And so um, you know, we set transit asset management targets every year as well as safety targets. So we'll be bringing these back next year um, but overall, you know, these things change constantly. Uh, the data we get is constantly being updated. And so, um, you know, next year will look very different. And uh, specifically, I think in regards to safety in the earlier conversation that we had um, is that we don't yet have the pandemic, uh, the data for 2020 that should be coming out any time. I think sometime in March, 
Uh, but what will be really telling, you know, as Ashby mentioned, is that, uh, you know, our fatality is going to go up because people are speeding more on, you know, open highways and things like that. So uh, it's just something that we measure over time. Uh, and so that's really the gist of uh, this entire thing uh, that we're doing here. So um, with that, uh, Emily, if you'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> And then finally, so for the next steps, um, I'll, I'll be updating the performance measure uh, report. Um, it'll include the adopted targets uh, from today. Uh, I also will be adding some information on target development methodology. I think that'll help us understand the numbers a little bit better, um, you know, where they're coming from, because there's a lot of, there's some, <laughs> some interesting math behind a lot of these targets um, that we get. Um, so I'll be fleshing that out in the report itself. And then, as I mentioned, that regionally specific information, I do have that, uh, and I was, Debating whether or not to incorporate it into the presentation today, but I didn't want to get bogged down. But if you have any questions about them, uh, please let me know today. But that will certainly be included in the performance report. Um, so we'll be able to compare ourselves uh, to the uh, not only to the you know the region on the transit side, but the state uh, and other regions in the state as well. Other MPOs, we can compare ourselves to that uh, uh, for the highway measures. Um, and then I'll be adding some additional background information. And then after that, uh, we'll be updating the targets. Uh, they get incorporated into the planning products, uh, namely the transportation improvement program and the regional transportation plan. Every time y'all adopt new targets, we have to amend the TIP and, and RTP documentation to include these targets. Um, and then the development of the performance measure system, as I mentioned earlier, this is gonna be something that's gonna be evolving over time. Um, this includes the development of the next state of safety report that I think was mentioned earlier. Um, it's linked in the presentation, and if you haven't had a chance to look at it, I would uh, greatly encourage anyone who's interested in safety to take a deep dive into that report. Um, there's a lot of fascinating information. It brings uh, it has uh, crash rate information all the way up into 2018 and really breaks it down into about every category you can imagine um, and really gives you a good sense of what we look like as a region. Um, and then, of course, uh, we've got an information dashboard uh, that NIR is working on that we will be uh, putting online, uh, which will hopefully give us a real time look at uh, the performance of the system overall in real time. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be evaluating project impacts in the region over time as they get built. Uh, that way we can compare with our analysis when we awarded them uh, and then after they're built and we can really track our investments and then uh, if we need to, you know, adjust our policies and our criteria, if we don't think we're meeting our targets or if we're doing exceedingly well, we may uh, realize we're doing something really right. Um, so uh, those are the things to look forward in the future. Um, and one thing I did not mention is that currently we, we support the statewide uh, targets, but I do think as the system evolves and we get more efficient um, at gathering this information and uh, as we build the system out, I do think in the next few years, we might look at uh, setting our own regional targets ourselves. Um, that would probably be best to coincide with a, a project selection a project call. That way we can align our targets, uh, you know, specifically with our investment decisions in real time. But um, I digress, uh, you know, I know we've got some other items to get to, but uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, staff and the technical advisory committee are recommending uh, adoption of these performance measure target updates uh, with resolution 2137. And uh, that concludes the presentation. If you have any specific questions about the targets or anything like that, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, is there a motion on item number seven? Okay, not all at once. I'll I'll move to the adopt <laughs> item number seven. Is there a second? I, think, I, think I can second it. Chair. I can second it, Chair. <laughs> okay, uh, motion by Long, second by Kitchen for item number seven. Is there, uh, if you could, um, Emily, if you could pull the presentation down. Thank you. Um, is there any discussion on item number seven? Uh, chair. This is Commissioner Shea. Um, yes, ma'am. Ryan said at the end, we we support the statewide targets. And I seem to recall there was some um, colorful discussion about this last year when it came up. And we didn't, have a, we didn't have time to make changes in it because we were up against a deadline. We had to adopt the state targets. Um, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but the, tar the state targets were that we would get worse in the future in, in various categories. Um, can you speak to this, Ryan? What are the state targets this year, and what is it that we're we're supporting? Because I think we all kind of felt like, well, we don't really want to adopt the target to get worse in the future. 
I know there were some more technical issues around it, but that was my yes. recollection from last year's discussion. Yeah, and I think that was in regard to the safety targets, and I can talk a little more in depth about that if you'd like me to. Um, so, uh, state targets that we're supporting. You made a reference at the end that we're supporting state targets, but I don't know what they are. Yeah, so for uh, for safety performance targets, uh, PM1, pavement bridge conditions, PM2, and then uh, system can, uh, performance, PM3, those are all um, tech site targets that we support. Um, and then I think the, the discussion last year was in regards to the safety targets, and so um, well, and I also thought it had to do with um, what was the third category you said? Oh, uh, system uh, performance. System performance, I think, was the one where people were really happy. I, I don't recall the system performance one, but yeah, so one of the interesting things uh, that really comes up year after year is that oftentimes, so the, the targets that are set by TechSnot are typically. <coughs> You know, they look at the next year and because uh, the state of Texas and our region in particular uh, is growing at such a rapid rate that a lot of these metrics are going up. Um, you know, one of the expectations is that, you know, we're going to have more people on the road because there's more people on the region. And so that means there's a likelihood that there's going to be more fatalities. But what TechSight does is they see anything that has a positive trend line. If, if, we're, if we're expecting more and then they look at what that expected number is supposed to be. And then they set a target that is 2% below that uh, expected number. Um, but one thing, and I, should, I mentioned it last time, but I should probably point out this time as well, when it comes to safety numbers in particular, is that TechSnot has adopted the Road to Zero program, which is looking to reduce fatalities to zero by the year 2050. And so their targets have gotten far more aggressive um, this past year in regards to safety. So they're ignoring that, uh, that number that's supposed to, you know, in theory, would go higher because of more people moving to the state, and they're setting a, a much more aggressive tone um, target against those uh, safety measures. And and they've uh, invested, I think it was like six hundred million uh, additional dollars into safety uh, projects in the state. So, um, but that's what if you see something going up, it's because of the population growth in Texas in general uh, across all these measures that we look at. Right, and thanks for the reminder about uh, Texas adopting the uh, safety targets. That's really really important. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, any other questions for Ryan on item number seven? Okay, we'll go again in the reverse order. Is there anybody against um, the motion to um, adopt item number seven? Okay, seeing and hearing none, uh, motion for uh, item number seven rather passes unanimously. Um, we will move on to item number eight, discuss and take appropriate action on 2020, 2021, um, UPWP amendment four. Good afternoon, this is Teresa with Campo. Um, this item is to take appropriate action on the fiscal year 2020 and 2021 UPWP amendment. Um, the Unified Planning Work Program is a federally required document that identifies the planning priorities and activities to be carried out within the Campo region. Um, the UPWP is adopted every two years and may be amended. Um, next slide, please. On um, January 12th, Campo received a request from Capital Metro to add their Pilot program for transit oriented development planning um, and to add funding of 900,000 of FTA grant funds and 225,000 of local funds. Um, next slide, please. So, staff is requesting approval of the fiscal year 2020 and 2021. UPWP amendment number four and its accompanying resolution. Um, um, before I get that, um, CAP Metro has um, sent a request today to add equitable in front or before um, transit oriented um, development. So if um, approval is is made, then we would add um, equitable um, as well to the amendment. And I'll take any questions. Madam Chair, this is this is Ashby. Just 
one thing before um, we ask for a motion and a second. Uh, we did receive some questions uh, from some of the board members wondering what um, the local funds meant. And when, when we say local funds in, in the context of this uh, specific unified planning work program amendment, we mean um, uh, funds generated by um, capital metros, one can say actually it's not local funds from, from uh, Campo. Okay, so thank you for that clarification. Clarification: It's local funds from basically from Cap Metro, not Campo. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Um, any other questions um, for Teresa on item number eight? Okay, is there a motion um, to adopt item number eight? Council Member Alter and second by Council Member Kitchen. Any further discussion? Anybody against item number eight? Okay, um, item number eight passes unanimously. Um, and I want to circle back real quick. Uh, we had skipped the um, minutes on item number five because I think there was a question about um, Council member or our Mayor Houston, you had a question on item number on the minutes and we waited for you to get on to. Um, do you want to address that question? Um, my question was when we discussed the bylaws last time, I thought there was a motion to postpone, but the link to the uh, video from the minutes was not finding a uh, question for me. So I was um, not able to go Mayor back and find it. Yes, ma'am. That was January meeting, not February meeting. Okay, never mind. And we, um, at our February meeting, we adopted the minutes reflecting that discussion. So that was, okay. you've slept since then. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. You um. Okay, um, so is there a motion to adopt the minutes um, from item number five? Okay. Um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Madison Harper, uh, there is a second. motion. Is there a second? Second, ma'am. Okay, second by Council Member Matea. All right, um, anybody against um, item number five? All right, uh, motion passes unanimously for item number five. Okay, so we will jump back now to item number nine, which is an information only item. Um, and I think, uh, let's see, Tim, are you taking this item? I'll start it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm gonna just start this and then uh, run through a very uh, brief summary of the major points of potential amendment of the bylaws and then turn it over to the hardworking subcommittee that you appointed, uh, which included Vice Chair Kitchen, Judge Oakley, Councilman Matea, and Commissioner Jones. Um, you all have a copy, I think the most current copy of both the, the bylaws as they exist and the proposed amendments. Most of those amendments were um, are, are really cleanup items. Uh, some of which are required to bring us into compliance with open meetings law. But the major um, uh, proposed or discussed um, amendments that the subcommittee reviewed had to do with officers under Section 3D uh, by the creation of a new officer position for a secretary and a provision that all three officers, the chair, vice chair, and secretary, would be appointed. Uh, uh, come from different counties within the Campo region. The other area was in uh, section 3E under meetings. Uh, while the chair would continue to have the power to put items on the agenda, uh, a discussed amendment would have uh, any agreement by any seven members of the board could also place items on the uh, TPB agenda. And then there's a provision in there that says, as uh, except as otherwise provided in the bylaws, uh, Robert's rules of order would uh, be applicable to uh, your meetings. 
Uh, the next uh, major area of amendments has to do with the executive committee under section four, uh, a lot of which is clarif clarifying, but um, still extremely important. Uh, the three officers plus the uh, joint powers agreement signatories would always be on the executive committee and the joint powers agreement signatories would have only one rep each on the committee. The chair could appoint other um, um, people to uh, the executive committee from other jurisdictions, but the total membership of the committee would never equal or exceed a quorum of the policy board. Uh, the executive committee would make recommendations only, and the amendment uh, allows now for alternates for each of the executive committees by their respective jurisdictions. And then the final area of discussed amendments had to do with the, uh, the role of the TAC. And there's two uh, discussed amendments there, I think both of which are in brackets. They have to do with a, uh, a, a possible amendment where all TPB action items would be posted for discussion and rec recommendation at a preceding TAC meeting. And um, no TAC review or recommendation would be uh, required on administrative items for the Campo office and the TPB. So those are your major amendments that um, were discussed or under proposal from your subcommittee. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the respective members of the committee for their, for their uh, comments or discussion. So um, we'll go and I don't know that there was a specific chair of the committee, but I want to hear from all members. Um, and so uh, council member kitchen has her hand quickly up. So uh, we'll, we'll hear from you first and then um, we'll go in uh, council member uh, Matea next and then commissioner Jones and then a batting cleanup will be judge Oakley. So. Okay. Okay. So, um, so th thank you, Tim. I think that uh, you outlined the major changes. I just want to remind people that um, this is, what's different about this than what we were talking about as a group is that we we really simplified things and I think we were we were all in agreement on this that what we would do is we would suggest adding a secretary position instead of trying to do a second vice chair so what we what we're suggesting is to add a secretary position to allow for some more opportunity for leadership but not do any of the other more involved kinds of things that were proposed. In other words, everything else is pretty much the, the same. We're not talking about any kind of rotation of positions. We, we left all that out. We kept with where we were. We were really just talking about um, adding a, a secretary position. So in the feeling from the committee, and I'll let others speak to this, is that that, that you know, allowed for some additional um, opportunity for leadership, but that the other things that we were thinking about were, were not really needed, uh, that we didn't need a second vice chair and we didn't need to guarantee any kind of rotations amongst them. So, so that's the biggest difference that you're seeing here is much more simple than what we had in front of us uh, before. The other thing I want to comment on is the, um, uh, the, um, the TAC. Uh, and that's on page 11. I, we, I think uh, we, I believe we're all on the same page in terms of what we're trying to accomplish there. We're, uh, we're still kind of talking a little bit about the language. And so I might have some suggestions about some more clarifying language, but as Tim put, put it, what we wanted to make clear is that administrative items for, uh, you know, for, uh, Campo, uh, staffing and other administrative type of actions did not need to go to the TAC. So that, you know, any office administration or human resource issues or staffing issues, uh, those are things for Ashby to deal with and there's not a need for them to go to the TAC. So um, the language that's in the backup right now is intended, I believe, and in, in my um, 
colleagues can speak to this too, but I think we're all on the same page that we were trying to get at administrative things. So um, those are the two things I wanted to, to point out. I think, Tim, you, you laid out well everything else that we talked about. Okay, Council Member Matea, um, we'd like to hear from you next on that, please. Well, first of all, I do want to say this. I thought this whole committee was about to be as hard as the cowboy signing Dad Prescott, and it worked out very, very smooth. I was, I was very impressed. He had a variety of different viewpoints and ideas, but ultimately, um, we came to the same conclusions. I appreciate us approaching the subject and having a kind of conversation about. Um, yeah, the regions change, the, the expansion of ideas and goals, and to have more inclusive aspects for various parts of the region at a leadership level and working from that, I think that's great. And um, I, I've, I've got to say overall, and I've got to thank my colleagues, you know, I'm the new kid on the block over here. Um, I, I think that it sets a good precedent moving forward on trying to get things done. You know, one of the things that I've heard ever since I've been on this, you know, August board is that, hey, wait a minute, we may not like this, this, or that. Well, guys, we're the ones in charge. So if we don't like something, let's go ahead and let's work on it. And this is a perfect example of, hey, if we don't like something, let's work on it and go from there. Um, I do like the line of delineation for Ashby regarding um, what's administrative in nature and working from that. I think that was great. Um, Tim, Ashby, I really appreciate you guys giving your clear thoughts on it. And I appreciate you you know, in the back and forth and talking about the vernacular that was applicable or not per se. Um, that's great. And that's the way it should work. So. Um, you know, I really appreciate this and I, I think it came out with a good product. Um, I have a, we'll go to um, Commissioner Jones next, but maybe one of you all or somebody else can answer this in your comments on the the TAC issue. Um, I, I, I think what you're trying to clarify is nothing administrative, um, but I think there's some other things that for example, um, you know, like the w Williams Drive study that that the uh, Campo did, um, that's very specific to not only Georgetown, but a very specific area of Georgetown. And I'm not sure that studies that are specifically targeted at specific areas um, should uh be reviewed by the TAC, but I don't know if y'all took that into consideration. Maybe Commissioner Jones or Judge Oakley, y'all can address that. Yeah. Commissioner Jones, yours. Uh, no, thank you again. And uh, thank you again for appointing to that committee. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that, Commissioner. <laughs> Being voluntold, thank you. Voluntold, that's right. And Ruby <laughs> was supposed to be doing all the talking for us anyway, so I don't know why you're even bothering the others, the rest of us. But uh, no, uh, no, we it was a good committee, and I, and I think what my other two colleagues mentioned were, was correct. Except we did not have agreement on the what we sent to the TAC. You know, uh, I don't I don't think that the the intention was for the TAC to be involved in something that was specific to like you know the Luling project or something that's going on in San Marcos. Uh, I don't want to add more to the tack than what they're already having to do because we have, you know, most of us counties that say, I know Travis County and Austin, y'all have a lot more resources to put towards the, the time y'all spend on tack, but our representatives are pretty, uh, that's, a, that's a strain on them to start adding more to what they're asked to, to consider on that tack. So uh, I think that was the only thing that we, we didn't come to a complete agreement on. So just to clarify, you're saying that the, the things that are highlighted in yellow um, that would be an insert item number five, there was not agreement amongst the committee on that particular issue. Is that what you're saying, Commissioner Jones? No, no, no ma'am, there wasn't. Okay. Well, well with Chair Long, let me just say that we didn't talk about, as a committee, we didn't talk about the yellowed language. I think what uh, Commissioner Jones is bringing up is we didn't talk about that at all, but I would agree with you that if it's a, if it's not a regional issue, it doesn't go to tax. So, but we didn't talk about that in the committee. Right. It just so, said, uh, yeah, I, I'm just trying to get to to sort out what what basically the committee agreed on and move that forward. If there's something that wasn't agreed on, that can be addressed later. But um, so and that was, uh, and that's Judge not what Oakley. I was trying to indicate either. Yeah, Judge Oakley, any well, additional comments? I'm, I'm here to testify there was actually laughter at the subcommittee meeting. We had fun. 
Um, <laughs> it was good. Um, and yeah, everything that Joan said, I agree. We we didn't you know, we didn't come to any conclusions on that. But it's 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 all in the wording of how we accomplish the same thing. The tax doesn't need taking taking up things that are administrative or uh, not regional, anything like that. Um, hey, in Bernie County, I pay a guy to go to that. He's not an employee. I have to pay a consulting engineer to go to that. So I, I need to make sure that it's worthwhile. So, and, and so for bringing this forward um, next month for action, so just to make for clarity's sake, everything that is shown as um, in, in the track changes version of the document that is in red, the committee support, except for what's in yellow. Or was a recommendation out of the committee? Yes, Madam Chair. Is that Chair. fair to say? Yes, Madam Chair. And I, I think that what um, James just said is, is quite accurate. It's, it's all in the vernacular. In the yellow language, so I, I'm not quite sure we want to maybe ask Tim to come up with some proposed language, or if he thinks that. Yeah, there's his. Darth Vader. <laughs> um, you know, you know or, uh, or or um, along those lines, if, if we think that it's good, it's good, but something that has some clarity. Uh, that we all, you know, uh, um. Yeah, and and I guess the comment I want to add just out of. Um, and I believe Caldwell County has to um, pay a consultant to show up for TAC. And, and out of respect for those members that, for most of them, um, it's uh, other duties as assigned on their job description. Um, I, I, I really want to be respectful of the tax time, and, and I think all of us do. Um, if, if you all could mute if you're not speaking, I think we're getting some feedback. Commissioner Howard, it might come from you. Um, that's that's correct. Um, Chair Long, uh, Caldwell County does have to uh, pay a person to attend the TAC meeting. Um, you know, we formerly had had unpaid volunteers, uh, but still uh, have to be re respectful of their time too. So uh, we'd we'd want a lot more information regarding any more duties assigned. To the attack. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. I see Mayor Morgan has his hand up. Yeah, I just, I guess I'd be curious for the committee. I don't remember, I don't mean, but maybe I missed it. Um, I don't remember the, the TAC committee being that big of a discussion on the initial bylaws we talked about in January. And, you know, a couple of years ago, there was a TAC subcommittee uh, where we examined the TAC. We, I think we made it smaller. There was some concern that it got to be much more policy driven than technical driven. And so I want us to be very careful because there's already been a committee in place that, you know, that, that committee's not to be policy driven. And I mean, and I know our employee that serves on that felt that's how it started getting. Uh, and um, so I just want to make sure we keep it very technical and not policy. So I think what I'm hearing for now is um, leave that piece out unless there's some um, wonderful clarifying language that can capture the spirit of everything you said. Uh, Council member kitchen. Yeah, I wanted to ask Tim to speak to this. The, and when you say leave that language out, uh, chair, you're talking about the yellowed language. I think right. Yeah, the yellow part. Yeah. So I want to attempt to, could you clarify the yellow language is something that that you round to all of us after our meeting? Because I think, but I'm not remembering correctly, I think you found it in the TAC bylaws. Is that right? Could you just explain to us where that came from? No, no, that did not come from the TAC bylaws. And yes, it was added after uh, because there was the discussion was, as I recalled it at the subcommittee, there was discussion back and forth about the one provision that is already in existence that says the TPP can, by majority vote, 
add certain items to TAC review. And then there was separate discussion about what's in there right now in, in the brackets. But I, I want to add, and maybe this partially responds. So to the, the brackets, I'm sorry, bracketed language is, is in the current bylaws. Cool. Is that what you meant? No, 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 no. no the, bra the bracketed language is is uh, basically to designate something that was added after the fact. But I would say um, I, I would like to volunteer to you know I just heard from uh, Vice Chair Kitchen the agreement to the basic issue as I understand it, which was the question of. You as a board, I think, don't want local only projects to go through the tax if all they are is local. If they're Williams Drive or they're Luling Master Study, et cetera, et cetera. I'm wondering, and I'm I'm quite willing to work with the subcommittee to try to come up with some vernacular language that addresses that issue. Um, but it's up to you, Chair. So he, here is my, my thought since um, this was not necessarily something, you know, I mean, and, and it, it, I'll leave it up to the will of the board, but it's not necessarily something that um, was originally part of the scope and in the spirit of trying to get this over the goal line. How about we do this? Um, leave that part out for now. Um, the item, what became number five under the TAC and um, move the rest of it forward. Um, and if you, you know, the committee comes up with something else, then we can add that um, after every, after the policy boards had a chance to see um, something on that. Up uh, chair. Yes. Uh, you know, since we're not voting today. And this is just for for everyone to review today. I think that by the time we vote in April, if the committee, the, you know, I, I want to take Tim up on his language because, you know, it is something we did talk about as a committee. We just didn't, when we reached agreement on the con, on the concept, and I think we can agree on the concept that you brought up today that we didn't talk about, but we would want to add, and that's that we clear it's not regional. I think we can come up with some language and, you know, we've, we've been emailing each other. I think I don't want to leave it off when we vote on it in, uh, in, uh, in April. Well, if, if there is language, I would say it has to be out 7 days before it can't yeah. be last minute. And yeah. cause you know, this has been on our agenda since October. So, um, let's, uh, you know, the, and if there's not, you know, and, and that's fine. If y'all don't have time to get it done before then, um, it's, you know, that that's not something that is slowing down anybody's work on anything. Uh, I, I think we could have it out and, you know, well before seven days and three weeks before or whatever. Can I have one thing on it, Commissioner Long, that I, you know, again, I have concerns with the language as is on all other agenda items i mean <laughs> that's a very broad perspective and almost sounds like it's just a repeat of what we do at uh on this policy board so it needs to be pretty clear uh for me to support uh a change because again i think there's a role for the technical committee uh, i think it's an important role but it's called technical advisory committee and so uh, i'm open to seeing that language but i will not support something that's as broad as that is and then I have another question for the board uh, or the subcommittee. Um, where how would y'all decide to come up with the number of seven to put it on an agenda item from, I guess right now it's just the chair and the uh, Ashby that determines what goes on? Well, I'll, I'll go to that one right now. I believe it was uh, like for a commissioner's court, you have to have two and there's five total members. And we started kicking around a number and I believe Tuggy, I think you're the one that recommended uh, a lot larger number such that it is a number that is like around a, a third, I believe. Is that not correct, Tuggy? Well, that's where you are now. 
with this proposal, we, we're, you're, you're currently at 21, and this would put you at one third. There was some discussion about whether you should go like commissioner's court, you should go slightly over a third to eight or nine, but you all settled on the seven. So, I should know this, but right now it's up to the chair and the and Ashby to bring agenda items. Is that correct? Now, Mayor, um, the, the, the way that the item, so currently it says that um, the chair um, or the executive committee can um, can recommend an item be put on there if if the chair has not put it on there. Um, and I, 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 I don't, I heard the question from somebody over the course of this, um, in that numerical was that to be 7 people from different jurisdictions. No, no, madam chair, we had that conversation and, um, we were just, we, we pushed it up to 7 just for simple fact that we, at 1st, we thought about. Two, three, and we're like, okay, we need to have a lower threshold. And so we just made it up to seven between our equations on that. And no one entity could just do it on their own. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I, I hope that this would be a very hypothetical situation to where the chair, I mean, I can't imagine just not letting something being on the agenda. In our democratic process, it's either majority like it or they don't. I just, I hope. I hope this number we come up with is really just an exercise. I, I, just, I can't imagine it being um, ever utilized. So, yes. I, I don't want a whole lot of talk. No, Madam Chair, I, I don't want it. I'm all about putting stuff on the agenda, but these meetings are long enough, and I don't want it to become where just willy nilly certain agendas are getting on there because something didn't agree, you know. We didn't, you know, even I'm including myself. I didn't agree with the, the majority that decided something. And so I think it's fair to have that number. I was just curious how it came about and I'm okay with it, but uh, I sure don't want to get misused and um, make these meetings five, six hours long because some of us don't get paid while we're sitting on this call. No, I hear we, appre we appreciate that uh, you are not able to be billing right now, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> If I would on this language on the whole tech, uh, technical committee, if, if Tuggy could come up with something that put out to the subcommittee, I don't think the subcommittee needs to meet on this per se. If they want to put it out and see if there's yeah. agreement among the subcommittee on something that he could come up with, to me, we either adopt it, tweak it, or not adopt anything and leave it exactly the way it was. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I just, I think being mindful of what we heard, particularly from the smaller communities of not wanting to overburden the tack with things that, that are not under that purview. Um, so if we captured the spirit of y'all's discussion, so we'll look forward to an action item on this at our next meeting. Um, Council sure. Member Kitchen. Um, I wanted to, there were 2 things that we didn't talk about as a, as a subcommittee uh, that I just wanted to raise here in case there's an interest in, in uh, addressing them. Just so that we don't just in case there's a, we, we talked about adding the secretary, but then we didn't. We didn't talk about what the secretary does. So what was suggested to me was 2 things that we might add. 1 was that. There's a provision right now that if the chair is not present, then if the chair and vice chair are not, then the um, the body as a whole will decide who who leads the meeting. My thought was, if we wanted to, we could say that if the chair and the vice chair are not present, the secretary would take on leading the meeting. So that was one item. Uh, and again, we just didn't think to talk about it as a committee. Um, the other thing was secretaries generally have some level of responsibility for the minutes. And so we thought, or I thought that, you know, we could add that too. But again, subcommittee didn't talk about this at all. It, it just, it, we just didn't think to, and it just occurred to me today. So I thought I should raise it. Vice Chair Kitchen um, and other uh, MPO organizations. 
secretary also certifies the quality of programs. So um, how about, the, I, I think I heard Council Member Kitchen say um, two things. One, the rotation, or if, if the chair and the vice chair are not at the meeting, then the secretary um, would serve as the uh, presiding officer for that meeting. And um, then um, what was the second one, Council Member Kitchen? It just had to do with the minutes. Uh, I think usually a secretary has some level of responsibility for reviewing the minutes. That they would just, yeah. that, that would be one more step. Staff would prepare them, send them to the secretary to review, and then they would not necessarily in anything else, but just another set of eyes on it. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Um, if, if y'all, Tim, if y'all want to um, sure. include that and bring that forward as well. I don't know that I don't see any big objections to that. I guess um, the mechanics of that would be that if we add that position that we wouldn't do that until the next officer election, we wouldn't do that mid year. Or is there a thought of trying from the mechanics of it, make it. When would you do that? I don't think we talked about that either judge. No. We did, but it's something to think about if we vote to have it. Okay, is it immediate or do we wait and implement it on the next officer election, which we do, I guess, in what, December or January? Uh, January. January. It's in January. Um, well, if you don't, if you don't say any otherwise, if you adopt the bylaw, it is effective immediately and you've got a vacancy immediately. So you fill a vacancy until January of next year. That would so, be the way it would normally, you know, um, Judge Oakley, despite the fact that you said you thought you could do this without another meeting, um, why don't you all convene one more time and make a recommendation on whether um, that should, because that you, you can footnote it that that portion comes into effect in January of 2022, or you can um, say immediately and we'll hold an election for secretary. So why don't you all make a recommendation on that? And to me, it's either or. I mean, I, I can't figure, say, do it in September. You know, it's, it's either immediate. Right. So, and, and, and Madam Chair, you're saying we have a meeting, but the meeting doesn't have to be an hour. The meeting could be about 20, 30 minutes, and if we can get it all later. depends on how much people decide to talk. It could be five minutes, it, it can always be shorter. <laughs> all right. Madam Chair, this is Jane Hewson. I yes, ma'am. I'm pretty good at bylaws. I'm usually the bylaws chair in whatever organization I'm in. Not volunteering this time. I think you're doing a great job. But I do pay attention. And I'm still kind of new here, and I'm still learning bylaws. And I have to stop and think, wait a minute, where does it say that? And I have to remember it's in that joint powers agreement. So, I have a suggestion in section three, item D officers, that we uh, ensure that our chair advisor and this new secretary position are voting members. And my suggestion is at the end of transportation policy board elects a chairperson, a vice chairperson, and a secretary, semicolon, each shall be a current voting member of the TPD. And then new sentence starts out with each shall serve for a term of two years. And that's a suggestion that I would add just to make sure that we've got all our eyes dotted and our T's crossed. Would you, if you've got and that can, in writing, would you send that to Tim, please? I will do that. Great. Yeah, it shouldn't change anything. I mean, uh, but just, you know, making sure that all the everything's in order. Any other comments on item number nine? Council member Alter. I just the sense if people felt like we should have um, some kind of term limit on the officer positions. Did y'all discuss that in the subcommittee? No, 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 we did not. 
Madam Chair, we didn't think anybody was a sadomasochist enough to actually have to worry about that issue. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the voters usually take care of the term limits. Yeah, I think uh, the um, well, I, it, it's not ever been in there in the past. I don't know. Um, I think Austin might be the only group on the policy board that has term limits built into y'all's charter. I don't know that any other of the entities do. We do too, Madam Chair. And oh, okay. Yeah. Counties don't have it. So. Well, I, I guess what I meant more is like not, I wouldn't think that you would be limited like over time from serving a number of terms, but in terms of, you know, there, I believe there's still a suggestion here that the chair should move to the to the vice chair, you know, when the the year or the two years are up um, for the term. Um, but I didn't know after that first chair's term was up whether we wanted to allow that to have that chair to be able to stay in perpetuity or not. That might be subject to a vote. <laughs> right now, it's not in there, and. Wouldn't that, it, Tim, is that not, that's depicted in the uh, joint powers agreement? No, it's not addressed anywhere. It's something that the subcommittee could discuss. I mean, haven't discussed it. It's not, it's not in the bylaws or the joint powers agreement. Although there is, as council member Alter uh, mentioned, there's a reference in the bylaws that it's preferred that the vice chair ultimately, whenever it occurs, the vice chair would rotate into the chair position, but it's not mandatory. And yeah. if you all yeah. recall, for, for those that have been around for a while, that was added at the suggestion of somebody the last time we changed things, because it's that um, was how another regional organization did it, but we've never followed that. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, it's 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 in there, but it's it's not been followed yet. So um, it says preferred, but I think that was added. Um, but again, preferred by who? I mean, it's a majority vote. That's what count. That's what controls everything. So yeah, and, and we did, Madam Chair. We did have a discussion when we were contemplating, um, I guess, changing it from second vice president or whatever vice chair that we had to secretary and there are people who just prefer to be they'd rather not be chair they'd rather be in a specific position um for a long period of time ashby gave an anecdote about i, I guess the houston mpo that but that was the issue with somebody there they would just want to be in that position be secretary or whatever it was for that period of time so i mean i i, I don't i don't have any heartburn one way or the other on it but i don't know if we necessarily need to formalize hey listen you're here for an next period of time and the other person with that yeah, I, I wouldn't support it. I don't like term limits. Okay, any other comments before we move on? All right, uh, so Tim, I believe you want to- Ma Madam Chair, I, I would just like to speak up for, I think it's a great practice in complicated organizations that the chair is in a, a learning role the year before. And so to the extent that our bylaws speak to a preference that the, the vice chair is serving, knowing that they're gonna become the chair, it also allows professionals to sort of map out time you know, commitments. And so I, I, don't, I wasn't there when it was added, but um, I was under the impression that that was the understanding and I'm certainly used to that. What it's worth. Okay, thank you. Um, any other um, discussion? Sorry, I'm trying to take input from a couple of different areas here. All right, so Tim, I believe you have item number 10. Um, this is just sort of a quick review of our right. code of conduct for the policy board members since we've got some new members on. And it's right. not bad to have a refresher for us, for those of us who've been here a while. Right, um, Chair Long, um, 
the uh, policy board adopted a code of conduct in 2018, and uh, you have a copy of the code uh, in your packet. I, I'm not going to uh, <laughs> reread it or go blow by blow, obviously. I, I strongly encourage you to uh, read it carefully. And when you have reviewed it and understand it, if uh, we, we ask that you return a signed copy acknowledging uh, your review to uh, the Campo office. But very briefly, um, obviously, the, much of the typical stuff in most codes, uh, compliance with the bylaws and related policies, uh, respect for board decisions after, of course, debate and vote, uh, informed participation, attendance at meetings, and a duty to stay well informed. Um, uh, under conflicts of interest and confidentiality, uh, representing the best interests of the Campo and declaring uh, any conflicts of interest, maintaining confidentiality where there where it's appropriate, such as personnel matters or legal matters, uh, but also uh, observing transparency, particularly with compliance with the Public Information Act and the Open Meetings Act, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, in board relations, uh, promoting respective communications among the board and staff, um, open communications among board members, uh, but subject to uh, the PIA, Public Information Act, and the Open Meetings Act. And in this regard, I... I'm, I'm sorry, Tim, Tim, can I interrupt you for one second? Emily, could if you could change the panel the view back so we can see the whole group, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Tim. And and sure. Uh, when I mentioned uh, the PIA and Open Meetings Act, I imagine that many of you are already trained uh, on the Public Information Act and the Open Meetings Act by your respective jurisdictions and your council or your open government office in your respective areas. If you have received your training, which is required by state law on both the PIA and the OMA, if you've received that and you received your certificate, then obviously you don't need to do that again for your service on Campo. But if you've not received that training, um, we're gonna be sending out a link to all of you that allows you to go immediately on the uh, Office of the Attorney General's website. You can pull down a one hour each video and look at it and obtain your certificate of training. If you don't wanna do that, then let me know and I'll come out and give you an hour's worth of training face to face. I'd love to do that actually, it'd be fun. Um, but that's really, really important. It's required by state law uh, that you have that training. Um, and obviously it's critically important to how you conduct yourselves as board members for Campo. You're dealing in billions and billions and billions of dollars. And uh, we want both the actual and perceived uh, highest level of integrity. I know you want that yourselves. Um, the last item, uh, the, a major item under the code is uh, related to staff relations. This was discussed at great length um, at the last amendment of the code, um, the uh, first item being that, that, generally speaking, the board recognizes the executive director as the chief of staff and operations of Campo, and uh, board member requests for staff. This is a cr critical item that was uh, discussed at some length. Um, board member staff work requests that exceed eight hours of accumulated staff time require a majority vote of the policy board. So if your work, work request to uh, staff, uh, excluding the chair, of course, but if your re work requests of staff uh, are gonna uh, not exceed that, then uh, no problem. But generally the policy is if it's gonna be a major project, uh, the whole board both authorizes that work and obtains the work product. The other item that I want to call your your attention to is the attached uh, ethics standards affidavit. 
your ethics on the MPO are specifically subject to uh, transportation code provisions. Uh, 472.034, there are specific ethics requirements related to uh, MPO members, and they are included A, B, C, D in the affidavit that I've attached to, uh, to the policy uh, board packet. Uh, it recites both uh, all five of the ethics requirements, which by the way, are also incorporated in the bylaws as required by the statute. And it also covers um, uh, items where abstention is required, where any board member might own a substantial interest in a, a piece of real estate or a business that's affected by MPO action. So if you would, um, you'll notice the affidavit refers to Senate Bill 585. That Senate bill has since been uh, um, codified at the transportation code reference that, that I mentioned. So uh, if you would take some time to look at that affidavit, it requires a signature and notarization, and it needs to be returned to the, um, the Campo office. Uh, and with that, um, I'll take any questions. Does anybody have any questions for 410? Um, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Um, which ma'am? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I only saw um, one hand go up first. Commissioner Shea, you'll be second. Our Mayor Pro Tem goes first. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to ask how far in advance we should plan those uh, in person uh, trainings. <laughs> Ma'am, I will be at just give me a week or 72 hours somewhere in between. I'd be Thanks. happy to do that. Actually, <laughs> I would in, I would welcome it. I appreciate that. Commissioner say you had a question or a comment. We well, it's, it would probably actually be. Um, are we posted for action on this? No, no. no it's so this is a discussion. Well, I would like for us to um, uh, include this when it does come back for action. Um, since we have a, a general engineering consultant and we have uh, a number of consultants who do a, a really a substantial amount of work at Campo, I would like to see these same uh, ethics codes and uh, codes of conduct extended to them. Well, as a matter of law, they are. But why would you say no, Judge Oakley? Why on earth would we want these same standards extended to our consultants? I thought it was for board members only. Well, why wouldn't we want it for the people who are doing the bulk of our most important work and that we're paying substantial sums of money to? I, I, I think okay, Tim was... Where are you going to draw the line? Well, who, has, who doesn't? Well, all of them. So, well, if you, do, you want them to observe the same codes of conduct, oh, you're going to have to do an ethics. So, I think Tim has. There's certain things under the Procurement Act that um, all of these folks have to abide by. Tim, do you want to address that real quick? Well, first of all, first of all, this briefing today is just relevant to your ethical requirements, not the procurement ethics that that apply to every uh, buddy that uh, Campo contracts with or Textile or City of Austin, whomever. And there's a whole, we might wanna come back and, and uh, give you some more information, I'd be happy to do so, to give you a laundry list of the ethical requirements that currently exist uh, on, for instance, conflicts of interest uh, for some of our some of our uh, 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 consultants, we've had issues in the past about that sort of stuff. In fact, pretty pretty uh, controversial issues. But Robust there's a whole discussion. regime that there's a whole regime uh, of, of of rules and regulations that apply to those issues. But I wasn't addressing those today. 
So I think if if um, Commissioner Shea um, and and I I certainly don't have them all memorized. I know that through procurement laws and every uh, and and several others, there's a substantial um, a, a ethics requirements and reporting requirements of those individuals that probably are in some cases a higher bar than what this is. But um, if if um, by, you know, and, and Ashby, if you could work with Tim and just pull together a uh, a memo, just referencing all those things, you don't have to, but I know that a lot of them are cited in different places um, in terms of what our um, consultants and that community has to abide by. That would be very helpful. That would be helpful. Great. Thanks. Council member kitchen. Yeah, thank you for doing that. I think that'll be helpful. Could you please um, add to it? Um, or, uh, I'm particularly interested in data, you know, um, and uh, confidentiality of, of data. So if you could, uh, you know, from our, from our um, vendors perspective, I imagine there's probably standard things that are included in our contracts with our vendors. So if you could just speak to that um, in, in your memo about what our practice is with regard to data uh, confidentiality, that would be helpful. And, and we can certainly do that um, by share kitchen and it, it depends. But in some cases, um, the data is proprietary. And in those cases, we, you know, we can't release it, but generally our contracts say that um, data is ours uh, when the, when the uh, thing is, when the uh, study is open. Yeah, that's what I would expect. And so I would just be thinking about, you know, data is ours, which means our our vendors can cannot um, sell it or use it. Um, but I'm also curious about things like, do we require them to destroy data they've had once they're no longer a vendor? Or what exactly do we do? I'm just curious about what our practice is. Okay, any other on specifically on this topic, the Campo Policy Board um, Code of Conduct or Ethics? Okay, seeing that, Ashby will move on to your report. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll be very brief. Um, uh, this month, I did write up a little sort of um, memo that we sent out with the packet, and I'll just to draw your attention to the um, item that was near the top, and it concerns locally preferred alternatives for two of the Capital Metro uh, transit lines. Um, uh, Capital Metro has been working um, uh, on the um, both the bus rapid transit and the uh, light rail lines for Project Connect for a while now. Uh, they have convened um, two work groups uh, to look at the uh, environmental analysis. Uh, Campo is part of those uh, two different uh, work groups um, uh, at the request of Federal uh, Transit Administration. Um, they have met at the groups have met at least once so far. We have attended those meetings. And um, Capital Metro showed us the schedule, the draft schedule for getting through uh, the environmental process. And um, it's about a year, a little bit over a year uh, from start to finish. And in order for them to meet their target, they will need to have their locally preferred alternative, which uh, basically tells the Federal Transit Administration um, what route and then what mode they will be picking for different quarters. Um, but those that has to be included in the transportation improvement program prior to um, Capital Metro receiving uh, a record of decision from um, the Federal Transit Administration. So, in order to meet the timeline that Capital Metro has laid out, that item will come to this body in um, May as a information item, and then it would be um, included in the June uh, board agenda uh, as an action item. And this would uh, coincide with our regular um, uh, long range plan and transportation improvement program amendment cycle. Um, that also allows us to go out and uh, do the public outreach that we normally do for that, and we will be including Capital Metro in that outreach. So, um, just wanted to point that out um, as things that are on the horizon for you that are sort of big things um, in the coming month. Thanks, Ashby. 
Um, item number 12, um, I don't have any particular announcements um, other than if you all remember when Ashby, I don't remember whether it was the January meeting or the February meeting sort of laid out what major tasks we had for this year. Um, April looked a bit light, so um, staff's looking at to determine whether we need an April meeting or not. Um, if that some of those things could be carried over till May, but um, we'll let you know sooner rather than later so you can plan accordingly on that. Um, the next TAC meeting is March 22nd. And um, if we um, do need to have the April meeting, it will be on April 12th. Um, I don't have any further um, announcements. Yes, Councilmember Kitchen. Yeah, I, I, I thank you for for checking into when we need a meeting. I, I would um, I would like to have one in April, even if it's a short one. I think it's important for us to get the bylaw um, item done and over with. So, I uh, I hear your input. Thank you. Um, so we will um, item number thirteen. We will adjourn this meeting at three forty seven. Thank you all. Everybody stay safe. Bye, Next everybody. time we come back, the Longhorns will be national champions. <laughs>